Strom Thurmond, during his life, had developed numerous healthy eating habits. Thurmond's typical breakfast would include fruits, fruit juice, oatmeal, lean proteins, and lean dairy. Thurmond reportedly did not smoke cigarettes or consume alcohol. He attributed his longevity in life and particularly in the United States Senate to his diet, good genes, and a consistent exercise regime. Towards the end of his sixth full term in the U.S. Senate in 1996, Strom Thurmond, in his own words, stated, Do you think the average person exercises like I do? Do you think the average person has a diet like I do? Do you think the average person has an optimistic attitude toward life like I do? At this time, his exercise regime included 20 minutes of twisting, bending, and stretching. Afterward, Thurmond would reportedly perform sit-ups and push-ups, operate his stationary bike, and occasionally swim. After being elected to a seventh and final term in 1996, Thurmond broke the record for the oldest person in the U.S. Senate. He would break the record for the longest-serving U.S. Senator the following year in 1997. He planned to retire at the end of his seventh term in 2003. As Thurmond began aging into his 90s, he began encountering various anticipated health issues associated with his age. This included conditions such as heart disease, hearing loss, loss of hip mobility, fatigue, and a sciatic nerve disorder causing pain. Thurmond's hip issue contributed to Thurmond increasingly using a wheelchair in his later years. He would relinquish his role as the chairman of the Armed Services Committee in lieu of his failing health. According to the Greensboro News and Record, Thurmond's condition became a concern to fellow Republican Senators Trent Lott of Mississippi and John W. Warner of Virginia, who spoke with Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole about the matter in 1995. While giving a speech at Strom Thurmond High School on Strom Thurmond Appreciation Day in October 1996, Thurmond had a gaffe incident, where he stated when referring to Solitor William B. Travis's role in defending the Alamo from Mexicans, he's the guy, that with 3,000 Russians threatening to attack. This gaffe raised subsequent scrutiny on Thurmond's mental capacity at his age. In the years leading up to his death, Thurmond would be hospitalized numerous times for various intervals for a variety of reasons. One of his first reported hospitalizations was in the mid-1990s, when Thurmond was hospitalized for multiple days in a military medical facility for an infection of his respiratory system. Later, he was hospitalized overnight at Walter Reed Army Hospital in October 1997 after overheating during the Promise Keepers rally in Washington, D.C. He was reported to have also spent time in the hospital that same year for influenza. On August 20, 1999, Thurmond was briefly hospitalized after suffering from what was reported as a case of overheating, dizziness, and loss of coordination during an appearance at the University of South Carolina. Thurmond was admitted to Palmetto Baptist Hospital in Columbia, South Carolina, shortly after 5 p.m. on this occasion. Thurmond emerged from the hospital about an hour and a half later feeling rejuvenated and interacting with bystanders. According to Dick Driggers, a representative of the USC's maintenance faculty who spoke with Thurmond at the university's reception before he was taken to the hospital, Thurmond, was standing up at the time I saw him. I talked with him briefly, and he showed no signs of illness. He was as sharp as a tack. A spokeswoman for Palmetto Baptist Hospital stated that Thurmond intentionally sought hospitalization simply as a precaution. A few days later, on the morning of August 25, 1999, Thurmond underwent successful surgery to treat an enlarged prostate at Walter Reed Army Hospital. Thurmond had been in good spirits, joking with the hospital's medical staff. He entered the hospital initially on the night of August 21 after complaining of fatigue. On May 10, 2000, Thurmond was admitted to Walter Reed Army Hospital again after complaints of a gastrointestinal upset and dehydration. Thurmond was in a fine mood, according to his spokeswoman Genevieve Ernie. Thurmond was discharged from the hospital on the morning of May 11, 2000. Just over a week later, on May 19, Thurmond was readmitted to Walter Reed for a stay of three days. According to Genevieve Ernie, Thurmond was admitted on this particular instance for a back ailment. Ernie stated that Thurmond never had his ailment formally and directly diagnosed. At around 10.45 a.m. on October 2, 2000, ABC News reported that Thurmond had returned to his political duties after being discharged from Walter Reed Hospital a third time that year. Thurmond spent the previous weekend in both Alexandria Hospital in Alexandria, Virginia, 
and Walter Reed Army Hospital after losing consciousness while at a Washington, D.C. restaurant with friends. His loss of consciousness was determined to be likely due to dehydration. Thurmond would discontinue his ceremonial post in bringing the Senate to order with the gavel as president pro tempore after a hospitalization in February 2001. On the morning of October 2, 2001, Thurmond was driven to the hospital by the ambulance after suffering an episode of weakness and lightheadedness at his desk in the Senate chamber of the U.S. Capitol. Thurmond's press team had initially released a statement that Thurmond had collapsed, later altering their statement to disclose that Thurmond was fully alert and was taken to Walter Reed Hospital only as a precautionary measure after being attended to by a U.S. Capitol physician. Thurmond would later make residence at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in November 2001, being allowed to come and go from the hospital to report to the Senate for daily duty. According to a spokeswoman for Thurmond, Rebecca Fleming, the 98-year-old Thurmond, was not in particular ill health and was in the hospital care for surveillance of his condition and administration of medication treatments. It was reported in October 2002 that Thurmond was hospitalized at Walter Reed for overheating and dehydration again while at the funeral for his longtime secretary. In January 2003, a 100-year-old Strom Thurmond, who celebrated his 100th birthday on December 5, 2002, would officially retire from the United States Senate. According to Thurmond's family, upon his retirement, Thurmond would return to his native Edgefield, South Carolina where he made new residence at one of Edgefield County Hospital's wings that was being renovated into a suite with two bedrooms and a living room. At 9.45 p.m. on June 26, 2003, Strom Thurmond died of natural causes at the county hospital in Edgefield. A family friend named Kathy Rainsford stated to Reuters that Thurmond's body had just stopped, that his body had just gotten weaker and weaker. Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist announced the news of his death on the Senate floor, stating, it was a century ago when Mark Twain was alive and Teddy Roosevelt was president and James Strom Thurmond was born in South Carolina. And at that time began a life really unmatched in public service. To his family, to his friends, we offer our sincerest sympathies. Thurmond was survived by second wife Nancy Moore Thurmond, two sons named Strom Jr. and Paul, a daughter named Julie, and a grandson. In December 2003, a secret surviving biracial daughter he fathered named Essie Mae Washington Williams, whom he had with an African-American maid named Carrie Butler, had publicly revealed her existence to the public. Upon his death, Thurman's body would lie in state in the rotunda of South Carolina's state capital for three days. His body was then transferred by horse carriage to First Baptist Church in Columbia, South Carolina, for a memorial service on the afternoon of July 1, 2003. Among the thousands of attendees at the service were both Democratic and Republican fellow politicians and allies, including nine former U.S. Senators and five U.S. House of Representatives members. Six people had delivered eulogies for Thurmond, including U.S. Vice President at the time Dick Cheney, U.S. Senator from Delaware at the time and future U.S. President Joe Biden, U.S. Defense Secretary Donald H. Rumsfeld, South Carolina Senate Member Kay Patterson, U.S. Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals Chief Judge Billy Wilkins, South Carolina Senate Member John Corson, and businessman and longtime close friend of Thurmond Bettis C. Reinford. Two South Carolina Baptist pastors, Rev. Fred Andrea, who served as First Baptist Church's pastor at the time, and Pastor Wendell Estep of Columbia's First Baptist Church were also in attendance. Andrea had stated about Thurmond, as a public servant, Thurmond never forgot that his position belonged to the people. We loved Strom Thurmond his zest for life, his enthusiasm, his beautiful spirit. How proud and graced I was to be his pastor and friend. In a portion of Cheney's eulogy, he stated, there has never been a political career quite like Strom Thurmond's. And unless medical science unlocks the secret of his vitality and energy, there probably won't be a career like his ever again. Biden was quoted stating about Thurmond in his respective eulogy, our differences were profound but I came to understand that as Archibald McLeish wrote, it is not in the world of ideas that life is lived, life is lived for better or worse in life. Strom and I shared a life in the Senate for over 30 years. At the end of the service, Thurman's body was guided outside of the church by a military guard as a bagpipe performer played a well-favored song for the occasion, Amazing Grace. Thurman's body was then interred at a family plot in Edgefield Village Cemetery. His role as Senator of South Carolina was succeeded by Lindsey Graham, who assumed office on January 3, 2003.